It's a privilege to uh, be here. Uh, as William says, my name is Scott Petapis. I am the uh, global head of M&A at Sherman and Sterling. And just before we kick it off, maybe it makes sense to do 30 seconds each just uh, by way of background, maybe introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Stacey Frazier. I'm in-house competition counsel at General Electric. Um, and I'm at the corporate level, so I do work with all the businesses, do a lot of M&A work at GE, as well as sort of more bread and butter antitrust investigations litigation as they arise. Uh, Michael Hartman, I'm uh, Senior Vice President um, at at and I've been with at and and the predecessor company, DirecTV, for about 15 years. I'm the, I've, uh, I do a number of things, but during all that time, I've been general counsel for our Latin American pay TV business. We have about 14 million subscribers spread across Latin America. Uh, so during that time, through transactions and other things, have gained a lot of antitrust experience, and my team and I manage most of that work for at and in Latin America. I'm Jessica Delbaum, I'm a partner of Scott, based in New York, antitrust. I had started my career at the Department of Justice doing antitrust work as well. I do primarily transactional M&A antitrust um, with a sprinkling of investigations and, of course, general counseling. I, uh, I don't do anything at all without without talking to, to <laughs> me first and foremost. Um, so so this is a uh, is a tremendously exciting topic. We we you know by definition could spend five days and we have fifty minutes and we're we're conscious of that. But um, what we've tried to do is informally break the session down into four sections, which is. Um, you know, the first section is to really talk about the planning stage, which is obviously critically important in the context of any M&A transaction. The uh, second piece is to talk a little bit about where the market is in terms of deal terms and what we are seeing uh, in terms of the commitments that folks are making. Uh, the third session is really to talk about that period between announcement and consummation of the transaction and talk a little bit about best practices for getting your announced deals to a closing. And then the fourth section is really uh, some of the softer issues around um, managing the overall antitrust process, dealing with the broader regulatory environment and some of the uh, best practices in that respect. So um, we can kick it off with the planning stage, which from the deal maker perspective is critically important. Um, there is obviously uh, typically tremendous pressure from business folks to get a process started and to get to an outcome quickly. Um, one of the uh, aspects of that is due diligence. And Stacy, uh, there's a lot of noise in the system these days and a lot of activity around clean team agreements. Sure. Uh, we see that a lot. I wonder, do you have any sense of best practices, guidance, what you're seeing, how to set up clean team arrangements that are consistent with the sort of overall deal dynamic in terms of trying to get to a, yep. a process in a timely fashion? Sure. Just to set the table a little bit, I, you know, and I apologize for those of you that know this, and it may be all of you, but clean teams are sort of data rooms where you put your most confidential, competitively sensitive information, and you limit access to it to groups of people who can't or are less likely to misuse that information. So people who don't have sort of the day-to-day -day strategy, marketing, pricing responsibilities. Um, the idea is they can't take that information from a competitor and then sort of go ahead and use that in a nefarious way. Um, and, and just again, I, I think it's worth emphasizing that this is a, a real issue that does get attention from the regulators. The regulators care about pre-deal information exchange. And there have, there's actually been enforcement action about it. Um, the FTC, for example, brought an enforcement action against some aluminum tube weld welders, I believe it was. And um, they, they challenged both the merger and the information exchange. And I want to get this right, so let me look at my notes. But the information that was shared in a non-clean team manner included, quote, non-aggregated customer-specific information, such as customer price quotes, details about customer negotiations, and customer-specific pricing strategy. And so not only did they require some, some divestitures as part of the deal, but they put limits on what the parties could do in terms of information sharing um, in future deal negotiations that apply to the parties for 20 years. So this is, again, I just want to emphasize this is a real issue. This is not just antitrust lawyers trying to get in the way of your deal. Um, and and Stacy, just on that, and I'm, I'm going to jump in as the yes. deal guy because I do find it is often the case where I say, look, our, our antitrust folks are telling us we need a clean team. 
and there's a lot of pressure from the business yep. folks who say, I don't get it, Scott, get the stuff in the data room, yep. don't understand it, and what's the real risk? Um, what, what, you know, when we say that the regulators look at this and there are enforcement actions, how does that happen? I mean, yep. what, how does this, how do you get yourself in trouble? So I think when you have a deal that's before a regulator, you're going to have you're going to be giving them documents and information, and so you're you're giving them the very documents that show you exchanging that information. As anybody who's been through a DOJ or FTC second request process knows, you are providing them with pretty much anything that touches the business that you're selling or buying. So there's an opportunity for them to see all of the conversations you've been having. And that's very likely to lead to a sideshow investigation and delay your deal, even if there's no specific enforcement action coming out of that. So I think that's sort of what I often tell my business people. You're probably right that we aren't going to get taken to court over this, but you're going to extend your timeline by two, six more months. Is that really worth it to you? And if we just put some basic information sharing hygiene in place, we'll get it done quicker. Okay. And so, you know, in terms of, of how you go about clean teams, I like to, th I think the most important thing is that you have to think about them and plan them before you do them. And I know that sounds obvious, but I, I often think things get put in the data room and everybody says, oh, we've shared half of it, what do we do now? <laughs> um, so I think at a very early stage, you need to walk through who's going to decide what is clean team information and how are they going to decide that? Um, how's that information going to be shared with the clean team? What can the people on the clean team do with that information? And then um, how does that information get dealt with after the clean team has used it? How is it destroyed, especially if the deal doesn't go through? So I think you need to go through those four steps and put that process in place before you actually um, start sharing information. And I'd also say that it's really important that you have dedicated resources for this. I find that if you have a very big deal and you have antitrust counsel, I like to have one antitrust lawyer who just does this because they don't get their attention distracted to go and then negotiate the deal the next day. They really can be a, an available resource that pivots very quickly to this so that you aren't holding up the deal team. And then in terms of how I like clean teams to operate, I, I, I think there are, there are a couple ways that you can make it more efficient. One is, I, there's a real tendency when you're starting due diligence before signing a deal to say, give me everything. I need to look under the hood of the car. I want everything. And I think you can sort of make that a more iterative process. Get me some of the less sensitive stuff first and then save the more most sensitive stuff for the end so that you can do the vast majority of your diligence while you're working through the clean team stuff. So that's one thing that I, I think we do. And then I think the other thing is think about whether information really needs to be clean team. Can you provide it in a different way? Can you redact it? Can you provide it in, in you know, an aggregated fashion? To go back to the example I used at the beginning, can you provide it in a non-customer specific way so that you can get it to somebody quicker without having to go through the clean team process? I think everybody understands clean teams are sort of here to stay. The FTC issued some guidance about a year ago reminding everybody that they are looking at information sharing. The DOJ is looking at information sharing more broadly. So you know, this is a process that's here to stay. And I think you just have to, to get out ahead of it before the information sharing starts and then come up with creative ways to, frankly, minimize the information sharing that actually goes through the clean team to prevent holdup. And then the final thing I'd add that I think is really important is snafus happen in, in the the information sharing process, stuff gets to the wrong person, um, that's going to happen. And what really matters from a risk management perspective is how you mitigate that, how you deal with it and document it. It, it, it. The agencies understand that. And so it's just a matter of dealing with it in a way that you've left a clean record, that you destroyed it, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's key because we see that, we see that piece yeah. all the time. Um, good, no, that's very helpful. <laughs> If you're interested in additional information on innovation and M&A, I encourage you to check out the Transaction Advisors Institute, which is a robust source for knowledge on M&A best practice. We host a series of M&A conferences, run an elite M&A academy, offer M&A masterclasses, conduct M&A research, organize the M&A Leadership Council, and publish a prestigious M&A journal. Members of the Transaction Advisors Institute include corporate executives, board members, and private equity investors that are interested in understanding the critical issues impacting transaction planning, structuring, and execution. I encourage you to get more involved in the Institute.
Jessica, one of the related issues is how to deal with HR information. And, uh, and, and you know, when I think of clean team agreements, I think of the, the, the commercial stuff, the pricing, and, you know, that's sort of the, the generic deal maker worldview. But I know HR related info is now very sensitive. It, you're exactly right. I think, as Stacy said, clean teams are here to stay. And I'd say 10 years ago, they were the exception. Now they're absolutely the norm between the FTC guidance, the FTC and DOJ investigations. But as you said, they historically have dealt with customer-specific pricing, um, big cost inputs, and the um, downstream competitively sensitive information. Uh, starting, frankly, in early 2010, 2011, the DOJ and FTC started to put more of a spotlight on the um, HR side of the world. And in 2016, they issued guidance for HR professionals. And one of the things that they said there is, listen, people, there, just as you think about you can't fix prices downstream, you are, companies are competitors, and it may be a wider sense that you're competitors um, in the labor market than you are in the downstream market, and there is risk in terms of sharing competitively sensitive information about salaries and benefits, and it's, it's not automatically unlawful to share that, but there's heightened scrutiny, and it is automatically unlawful to do things like agree not to poach each other's employees outside of the deal context, for example, or to set salaries. Um, so the HR has gotten a lot more stringent, and I think that is something that I know I've gotten pushback from people on why does this need to go into a clean team. It's you know just the salary information, and there's always been some um, data privacy concerns and HR, you know, our employment colleagues have always said we need to be careful about certain information, but you now need to think about it from an antitrust perspective. And in the 2016 guidance, the agency said, even in a deal context, yes, we realize that you need to share information, but you need to have proper safeguards. And the safeguards are along the lines that Stacy was talking about of having the um, disaggregated information go into a clean team, fine. And obviously, a wider group needs to know things like what are what are your HR costs, and aggregating, you know, that we pay our C-suite X millions of dollars, that we have, you know, 30 managers, and the average salary is whatever it is. All that is fine to share, um, and as Stacy said, you might just have that automatically not be in a clean team to start with, versus having the details in a clean team where somebody who's not involved in the hiring decisions can do a check, basically. And one other thing I would say is oftentimes as a seller, and this is not just on the HR piece, but just overall for the diligence information, often the business interest and antitrust issues interests early on align because the seller doesn't know who's ultimately going to buy them, and they want to be cautious about their competitively sensitive information. But when you get closer and closer to signing, there's often more willingness of the business, and they get more excited about the deal. And they say, fine, like they can check under the hood, and a wider group can check under the hood. And that may be true from a commercial perspective, but the antitrust considerations actually continue to apply, not just through signing, but actually through closing, yeah. Yeah. to so, the extent you're a competitor. Yeah. So, so I think for the audience, to, to, to me, the real hope is that there's four, you know, four or five items today that you walk out of here, and they're real takeaways, and I think this is one of those. And, and I just want to push Jessica because uh, I get this a lot. Uh, you know, there is a lot of pressure for in, in you know, the deal context to get that stuff in the data room. I'm going, I just got an email now saying I want the stuff in the data room, Scott. Again, the real risk for deal makers here is you put it in the data room, it's not clean team, you've shared the, the, the actual comp numbers, and, and, what, and again, what happens? So we're making a presentation and the regulator says, you put that stuff in, you shouldn't have shared it, because, because what? Because the concern, especially, so it's not automatically unlawful in the US. And so again, we've been taking a US view of this. Yeah. You go to Europe, and the information exchange risks actually increase quite a lot because the European Commission, in particular, has taken a much stricter position um, on the sharing. But if you go in the US, it's not automatically unlawful. But if you're, say, in a more concentrated industry, yeah. that you've got um, fewer competitors, fewer um, buyers of hirers of people in a certain industry, and you're sharing um, wage information, they say that could lead to a lessening of the salaries or the compensation that you need to pay, yeah. and that's a violation. And as Stacy said, at the end of the day, it's unlikely they're going to go to court over that, yeah. but 
it will s distract the investigating agency because they like going down those little rabbit holes. And, and so instead of spending the resources on why your deal, Substantive. it substantively isn't a problem or addressing the problem that they're, the limited problem that there may be and finding out a remedy. They focus on this exchange of information and why that was a problem. And then they start to wonder about um, over, uh, credibility and what else the, the companies are doing. So it just casts a taint over it. It's not insurmountable, but it's just, do you really need to do it? Is it worth it for the potential pain later on? Okay. No, that's uh, extremely helpful. I don't know whether there are questions on this piece, but this, this one is one that I think is an important takeaway. Uh, switching gears, Michael, you've got a tremendous amount of experience doing sort of cross-border deals that involve you know, multiple jurisdictions. Any um, best practice in terms of how you approach this at the planning stage and you're looking at a deal that's going to have multiple antitrust filings and you know, the goal obviously is to have a coordinated defense. How do, you, how, do you, how do you go about that, um, Michael? How do you think about these things? So sometimes there's a, there's a little bit of tension there, obviously, because if you're doing a deal at a global level, there's a small group negotiating a deal, public M&A deal. People want to run and get the deal done. Um, but, if you, but, you need to, but, but you need to think about, OK, what's it going to take to get, get this deal done? And if it's a global deal, you're going to have to get antitrust approvals across the world, potentially, or certain, in certain regions. And most law firms will be able to go through and based on some company information, tell you kind of where you're going to have to get a pre-approval and that kind of thing. One part that kind of gets missed in some areas is what are the regulatory considerations in addition to antitrust? And we face this a lot as a, as a telecoms company or pay TV company because we're, we're regulated in different industries. And it's worth thinking a little bit at the beginning to the extent you can or early on what's going to be your strategy because in addition to just the complexity of trying to get approvals through the worldwide, the overlay of regulatory approvals that you might need in addition to the antitrust approvals lends a complexity to the task. And it's a complexity which is not going to be necessarily the same in every country. And so you need to think about it substantively uh, and strategically. And then you need to think about it in terms of how you're going to organize this effort. Because especially where there's a regulatory focus, if you do a top-down effort where your law firm has an antitrust expert who knows law firms in all the world, and you just start churning out paper and doing your filings, which is part of the job, you miss the local knowledge and the local, and the local know-how about how to get a team done. So it can be more complex to roll it out, but it will pay dividends if you've really thought about it. And just to give you some examples uh, that were recent for AT&T, here in the US, uh, there, when AT&T acquired Time Warner, there was no, um, because be, it, there was no need for FCC approval, for AT&T to get FCC approval, as long as Time Warner had no FCC licenses. Now, they have no major licenses, like a pay TV license, but they do have all kinds of little licenses. They have satellite uplink licenses that CNN uses. They have the licenses used for trucks on remote locations. And there was a concern that because of that very technical point that they would uh, exercise jurisdiction over the transaction and be involved, and then you'd have, a, you'd have your DOJ review in, in addition to FCC review. So one of the first things AT&T did is we immediately, and Time Warner did, is Time Warner went and they sold, they got rid of all their FCC licenses yeah. within the process of about three months. They outsourced services. That ended up being, as most of you know, enormously important in what ended up being a really complex uh, antitrust procedure process that we passed through here in the US. And we had a similar point in Brazil where there was a regulation that maybe was in play and could have been violated. Our focus was get the antitrust regulator to say, we're going to leave that for the regulators post-closing. We're just going to do our antitrust review. And because of that, we're able to get our approval in a way that we might not have done so otherwise. So it's worth thinking about these things. If you're a deal maker, ask the question. Ask your attorneys the question. If you're the, the deal lawyer, ask your team what are the questions and spend a little bit of time going through some of those things. Yeah, very, very helpful. Well, I'd love if, if we have time. Uh, you know, you said something, Michael, that um, I'd love to circle back on, which is um, uh, the interplay between the different approvals and closing certainty. And I'd love to come back from, a, from a, the perspective of a guy who does a lot of sell-side public company work, trying to limit the conditions. I'd, I'd like to come back at some point and get an institutional view as to how much risk you take in terms of closing over you know, the absence of receipt of approval. So we should, we should come back. Um, Stacy, uh, 
sort of switching gears to deal terms and what people are signing up to in terms of the, the, the commitments. Um, are you seeing people uh, sign up to hell or high water commitments? Um, you seeing people give it? What, what do you, what's the general lay of the land these days from your perspective? Uh, so in terms of what I'm seeing or reading about, I think everybody asks for a hell or high water on the sell side and I don't think many people get them. Um, I think it's an opening negotiation, and I think that um, it, it's it's what everybody comes out with, and you eventually agree most likely to something along the lines of a reasonable best efforts with some sort of cap or material um, MAE clause or something like that. But I don't think we're seeing, I don't want to say never on the hell or high water because that's not true, but I think it isn't realistic to expect a hell or high water clause. And I think that's sometimes true even in a deal that's not strategic, I, you know, I think as a seller, you may say to a buyer, well, if you don't see antitrust risk, just take my hell or high water, what's the downside to you? But I think then what a buyer says is, well, if there's no antitrust risk, why do you need the hell or high water? And you sort of do this little dance for a while until, you know, somebody gives up. But so I, I don't think we're seeing it very often at all. The other thing I, I, I sort of would add about the hell or high water is, I think there's a sense that if you get the hell or high water, you have 100% certainty. And I'd say that's, I don't think that's true for a couple reasons. One, if you're going to get our hell or high water provision, usually a buyer is only going to take that on if they get sort of very strict control of the regulatory process and get to direct the seller on how the seller goes about the regulatory process, which means the seller is going to have to sort of do everything the buyer asks them and have no foot faults or else they could be viewed as in breach of the contract and if they're in breach of the contract, then the buyer may not have to go through on their hell or high water. Um, um, obligations. So I think one thing to think about when you ask for hell or high water is are you ready to take on the responsibilities of being sort of incredibly thorough in following to, you know, dotting every I and crossing every T what the buyer wants to do on the regulatory strategy. And then the second, so, so I think that's just one thing to think about is you, if they, before they actually have to do that final big divestiture they may not want to do, they may want, they may go back and see, hey, did they do anything to screw us up at any point? And so I think that's something to keep in mind. The other thing I'd add is you, a buyer could also get to a point where a hell or high water, um, they'd rather breach the sales contract than go through and, and end up in court and again, go back, going back to, okay, well, did you breach the sales contract first? And so. I, I think I just don't want to, to sort of have hell or high water equate to 100% deal certainty because I don't think it, it really is. Yeah. And, and there can be situations where the agency would say, there's, We're just, there's, there's no remedy, yeah. right? We've seen that in yeah. a number of deals as of yeah. late where they say, yes, you've offered this, but it's not sufficient. And theoretically, the hell or high water says you will divest everything you are acquiring, but the agencies don't go for that, yeah. right, in reality. So you can have a gap because of that as well. Yeah. You know, Stacey, you make a good point, and, and it's obviously, it's a, it's a very emotive issue, and it can be one that um, you need to be sensitive to your own client's internal dynamics, you know, and, and what I mean by that is I think it's important to be very thoughtful with your own internal constituents in the first instance and think very hard about what you want to ask for mm -hmm. because there is a tendency for business folks to internalize expectations. Yeah, I went through that. I'm not sure where John is. We went through that in the summer. Um, and I think, you know, to be fair, we probably were we probably went too far on the sell side in what we were asking for. And John got his clients to a good spot. And I think we got to an outcome that worked for everybody. We certainly didn't get everything we wanted. I can tell you that our client had made it you know, they had internalized some of the early discussions around the need to have closing certainty and really got themselves tied up in the fact they needed a pure hell or high water. And it was very hard to, 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 to sort of overcome that. And, and, you know, we had some, we had a thoughtful counterparty and we got to the right outcome. But you need to be careful when you go out the door. And that segues into what I think is a really important topic here, which is we are seeing more cap divestiture commitments. When I started, people told me, um, early in my career, Scott, be very careful about um, the specificity around the, divest the, 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 the cap divestiture in terms of what you put in the contract because you're going to create a roadmap for regulators. And for a long time, I believed that to be the case. Um, I'd throw it open to the panel. Jessica, Stacy, we talked about it the other day. 
what's the real risk? And so, you know, I've asked, I've asked you for a hell or high water commitment. You won't give it to me. We agree on a $500 million divestiture commitment. We put it in the contract. What's the real risk that that's a roadmap? I think it is overstated, and certainly the agencies will tell you it is overstated, that there have been instances, and, and I have on the private side, um, had cap divestiture obligations where I don't even get a preliminary investigation from the agencies. So, you know, the, the risk that, well, there must be something there because they've agreed to it, so I need to open up an investigation. They've been satisfied based on the documents that go in with the HSR filing, some public searches that they don't need to do anything. I've had instances where they have done a preliminary investigation or maybe even an in-depth second request investigation and at the end of the day have still been able to say, listen, this is the seller was looking for deal certainty and this is the way that we got there, but there isn't a substantive issue that you have to be concerned about. And then there have been times where they've said, we want something more than what your cap says. And said, that's great, that's what you've agreed to, but that's not gonna remedy what we see as the problem. Yeah. And we want more, and if you don't give us more, we'll challenge the transaction. So I think it's probably a bit overstated that it's a roadmap issue that's going to lead with certainty to an in-depth investigation and remedies. There may be instances, um, and I think they're at the margins, where you've got a retail transaction, for example, and you've got a cap divestiture by EBITDA or by um, sales, <coughs> excuse me, and there are some that are clear cut that are gonna go, you know, they're in a town where it's a two to one, no question that the agency is gonna ask for them for a remedy in those. And then maybe you've got some where it's a closer call of whether there's a competitive concern and you're below your cap. Perhaps it's a little cynical that the agency might say, well, well, we know you're not gonna really fight us on this because it's below your cap and you're gonna do the deal. Now, any agency person would say, and I'm a former agency person, and would say, we're not gonna seek a divestiture when there isn't a competitive problem. But it's just a question of, are you gonna to go to the mat over that? Yeah, yeah. Stacey, would, you agree, ahead, Michael? I, I, would, I would, I agree that it's not conclusive, but, um, particularly when you get into less sophisticated jurisdictions, mm. let's say, outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. or maybe the EU, it's a marker, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm, we're still concerned about it, and if we can get comfortable that it's not a material term, we might agree to it separately so it's not in disclosed documents yeah. um, for that reason. I would say that it's the concern is a little bit exacerbated. This is a little bit of a different topic that we can talk about. Because what we're seeing is an increased focus on regulators to say, no, behavioral remedies aren't right. enough. Right. Right. We need yep. to have structural mm -hmm. remedies. And so they're really pushing, trying to get to divestitures. And their concern around divestitures is, are they feasible? Yep. And, one, and parties will always say, no, it's not feasible. I can't, I can't. So mm -hmm. if, you've, if you've already contemplated a divestiture of a particular size, it's really hard to argue that it's going to be complicated or not feasible or overly material to do one. Yeah. Yeah, you make, you, know, you, know, you make a very good point, Michael, about some of these less sophisticated jurisdictions. The other thing from the pure dealmaker perspective, I, um, I find myself anxious around the inputs to get to the right number. And obviously, if the, if the cap divestiture is a, is a number that we all agree is, leaves you significant cushion, it's non-issue. But I, I, do, I do get a little anxious around you know, can you really do the work with, with specificity that gets you to the right number, even assuming away the risk that it's a roadmap? And, and, you know, we have a live deal in the market with the cap divestiture commitment, and, you know, we spent a lot of time on, on, on that number and getting to the right number. And, uh, you know, I'm anxious about it. So there's one integration issue I want to skip to, but just before we do that, um, just for the benefit of the panel, any feel uh, for what the market is these days in terms of reverse break fees? And I, and I get, and I'm the first guy to tell you this, it is a product of the negotiation dynamic. But any, any feel for it, Jessica, in terms of the... the well, numbers? funny, Sherman actually tracks them. <laughs> so if you go to our yeah. website at Antitrust Unpacked, you can see, and, and you know, they are um, public transactions, they're strategics, they're not just financial buyers, so certain reverse break fees um, wouldn't be captured. So even the, for example, the vintage rent-a-center one that had an above market reverse break fee of 15.75%, 
isn't captured there because it's technically a financial buyer, even though they had a strategic company in their portfolio. But um, if you look at from the time that we'd been tracking them, which was from January 2005 through the end of the first quarter of this year, the median was 4.4. The mean is a bit higher because you have some outliers like um, Monsanto Delta Pines, which has close to 40%. Um, and that's, you know, these are go to ne highly negotiated and bespoke. And that one was because the parties had tried to do the deal before and it had been blocked. So it was if we're going to the stance again, you're giving us a lot of protection if we don't get the deal through. Um, so the, the uh, mean is higher at 5.3. If you look back just at the last three years or so, the that's median. Equity, that's equity value, right? Yes, equity value. The uh, median's gone down just slightly to 4.3, um, and the median again went down to 4.7. So, you know, roughly 4 to 5%, um, but they're really bespoke because some will be like 0.3%. And then on the um, high side, you've got the Monsanto Delta Pines, which is like 39.8%. Yeah. I would say we're also seeing a slight uptick in the number of deals that have a reverse break fee. Yeah. The one thing I'd say, it is always by definition a, a product of a negotiating dynamic, the leverage of the parties. The one pure deal maker takeaway, and I would just, I, I cannot overstate this, is you want to you wanna be very thoughtful and really rigorous in terms of how you've constructed the mechanics around it so that if mm -hmm. you are on the sell side and you've agreed on a reverse break fee, you need to preserve the ability, and Stacy touched on something, if, the, if, they, if there is bad behavior on the part of the buyer in the sense that they are not doing what they have committed to do in terms of trying to obtain regulatory approval, you need the ability to go out and get spec performance. And frankly, um, it shouldn't be an option. And when you draft the papers, you need to have the ability to force people to do what they've committed to do. Only once they've done that can the deal be terminable and a reverse break fee collected. And, and, and the drafting, this is one area where the words matter and you need to get the drafting right. Stacy just touched on it briefly. She said, you know, if there's bad behavior, and on the sell side, you need to ensure you've got recourse to force people to do what they've said. The flip side is, if I'm on the buy side, I want to really narrow the set of circumstances under which I've done, I've acted in good faith. I have done what I, I've, I've done what I committed to do, right? I'm, I don't want the risk of a footfall that exposes me to a damages claim beyond payment of the reverse break fee, which should be, in an ideal world, that should be the exclusive remedy. And again, this is, a, this is a topic we could spend a lot of time on, but, but I cannot overstate that piece of it, and you need to make sure your lawyers have spent time on that piece. There's a lot of things that you can get away with. Uh, the reps and warranties, right, they matter. We look at them closely, but it's these kind of things where there's real exposure for the deal makers, right? If it doesn't work and it doesn't hang together, then people are gonna be looking at all of us. Um, so I just, you know, I, I focus on that. Um, when, we, when we get to that stage of the transaction where the good news is we've announced a deal, we're now in that period between announcement and closing, and it's a sensitive period, and one thing that happens is we get the call immediately from the business folks saying, let's get the integration going ASAP. Want to get the integration going as quickly as we can, and, and JD, we are always trying to balance off the risk of the gun jumping. What's the risk? How do you think about it? How, how, how much can we do while we're waiting to consummate the transaction? So the, the oh, go ahead, Stacey, sorry. Go ahead, oh. please, JD. I mean, the key mantra is plan, don't integrate, um, and that really is critical. The agencies, and not just the US agencies, but and not just the European Commission, which came out with a huge fine a year or so ago, I lose all sudden of time, but you know, Brazil is focused on gun jumping and a number of other agencies are as well because they're very worried about the buyer acting as if they already control or own the target prior to closing. And that goes to integration planning. It actually goes back a step to what we were talking about with deal planning as well and the conduct of business covenants that are in the agreement and they're taking a close look at those as well. So, um, you know, obviously the buyer wants some certainty as to what they're buying and doesn't want the seller out there, you know, giving away the, sh the shop and giving huge discounts that they wouldn't normally. But they conduct a business should be tailored so that the target can operate in the ordinary course without having to always go to the buyer. And similarly, during the um, post-signing pre-closing period, they need to continue to operate that way. 
But the parties, the government also realizes that the parties want to be able to operate on day one and to do as much as possible to flip the switch. And a lot can be done, but it needs to be done thoughtfully and in consultation with council. And so some of the same considerations that Stacy was going over in terms of the clean team and diligence still apply post-signing. It's not suddenly that you can have access to all of this. You need to still have restricted groups. You need to have a tight integration committee. I've seen clients use um, still third parties to help with the integration planning yeah. to help protect. How much, how much risk is there, and, and I think this will be meaningful for people, how much risk is there truly around the conduct of business covenant? And, and what I you know, what I mean by that is all of you uh, appreciate the conduct of business covenant, which commits the seller to conduct the business in the ordinary course between signing and closing. And, you know, you've got your litany of, of reverse or sort of negative covenants. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I face it a lot where buyer's counsel will say, Scott, there is no optionality here. There is no outs. I effectively own the business today, right? We're going to go through the regulatory process, but I can't get out of the deal. So I want a lot of control. And I always say, well, you can't get it because our antitrust colleagues say you can't. But really, what's the, what's the real risk? And is there a balance there, Jessica? I mean, is it, is, are you exposed if you really turn over control? Yes. I mean, just unambiguously, yes. In the US, the um, FTC and DOJ can and do bring gun jumping. And they may bring it even if there's no substantive concern with the transaction. They can and do bring gun jumping. And the potential fines are, I didn't write it down, 44,000 and change. It's one of these adjusted numbers, so it's weird. Um, but each day that you're in violation, and they've imposed fines that are in the millions of dollars. The EU last year imposed a huge fine as well. Um, so they're real risks. Yeah, you agree? Yeah, huge risks. And the EU fine, it was, it was about 125 million euros. Um, and the EU fine focused on several things in this particular case, but one of the things was the contract, to the point about what your buyers want, the contract gave the buyers certain rights to sort of um, approve price changes, approve strategy, and things like that. And that actually factored into the European Commission's decision to fine this particular buyer, because they said, yeah, just because it's in your sales contract doesn't make it OK. It still was too much day-to-day -day control. Um, but I would say that if the company hasn't, whatever the clause is, if the company hasn't backed it up with a process showing yeah. that yeah. You're, just reg you're just complying with a contract, if, if when they ask the question, you don't have a group segregated and things like that, yeah. you're going to be in a tough situation. If you can say, these are specific points that are presented in a controlled way, we're not involved in the day to day, you'll probably yeah. be OK. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've also I, had I, a situation. I think, is, I think this is a really important takeaway. Where you might have something in the contract. But then you say, we actually never did it, right? So the, the contract was there, that there were words there. But then, oops, we talked to our antitrust people, and we actually never did it. And, and then you won't have the gun jumping, but you may still have the sideshow of the investigation. I think the key point was the day-to-day -day point you just made. So you know, it's, it's one thing when you say, hey, you can't hire someone who's going to make $4 million without talking to us. That has a material effect on the value of the transaction. But it's the day-to-day -day operational control. And so that's what you have to work with your team on. Is this something that you do in the ordinary course, or is this something that is truly extraordinary? At what level are you setting the material contracts at? Right. If you're setting them at a million dollars, but 90% of your contracts are for a million dollars, you're going to get into a day-to-day -day problem. But if that's the exception, it should be fine. Yeah. I, th I find sometimes my, the, the internal clients, they, after they sign the deal, they focus on like operational risk, right? Integrate, integrate, integrate. I said, don't forget about execution risk. You've yeah. got a lot of execution <laughs> risk. And if you start talking to the regulators about whether you're gun jumping, your execution risk just went up a lot. That's a, that's a, great, that's a great bit of advice. Um, so I'm sensitive to the time. Uh, William, is it, uh, we've got five minutes left. I'm, I'm getting so old I can't see the, okay, okay. So there's, 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 two, there's two additional items that I think I um, really would like to spend some time on. One of them, I think, is a much broader conversation, but there are obviously a couple of deals in the marketplace where there is a dispute around payment of the reverse break fee. Um, bad situation for everybody to be in, both buy side and sell side, right? Because however it plays out, it's going to be messy to get to an outcome. And whether you win or lose, it's probably not a positive dynamic. Um, again, would just reiterate, really, when you're on the buy side, really be rigorous in terms of the commitments you're making beyond the 
divestiture commitment or the pure commitment you're making to get regulatory approval, look at the language and, and go through it word for word and understand exactly what you've said you will do in the context of making your commitment. Do not allow yourself exposure so that you have a foot fault or you've engaged in bad behavior or you've done something that breached the contract because you committed to cooperate or a certain level of efforts in a way that you hadn't internalized and your clients didn't. And I just, I, I really stress to you, the words matter in the regulatory covenant and the words matter in the reverse break fee mechanics. Understand what you're signing up for and make sure that the words reflect the commitment that you've made at the business level. And I just can't overstate it. I'd love to spend more time about these disputes, but I think it goes well beyond the time we have. The one thing I did, did want to talk about, Michael, you raised the other night is, um, what do you do in a set of circumstances, and it's happened to all of us, where you know, you've got several, you've got a bucket of required regulatory approvals. The ones you thought were going to be an issue have come in. You get caught off guard because there's an approval you're waiting on. The deal is otherwise you know, ready to be closed. The parties are ready, willing, and able to close. How do you manage that? Have you been in that situation? You know, it's a tricky dynamic. Yeah, it's really tricky. I mean, the first thing I would say is you've probably had that conversation up front about which jurisdictions can hold up a transaction or not. Yeah. So you've already decided a little bit, like, which are the big rocks that got to be in place and the buyer and the seller have agreed and which other ones you might, you might run some risk. So, that, so that's the first thing. The second thing, you know, if you have a major transaction, but one of your countries where it's a closing condition for both parties or one of the parties that you have an approval in a particular country and, and that approval's not coming in and it's holding up the transaction, it gets to be very difficult, particularly if it's a jurisdiction that people, it's important, but people aren't familiar with, like mm -hmm. Brazil mm -hmm. or someplace else, China maybe. Yeah. Um, so that creates a lot of pressure. So you have to start looking, okay, what are my alternatives? And you'll immediately start looking, well, can I carve that business out? So can I close around it? And that involves a lot of engagement. What's permitted under local law? What can I do in terms of the business? And you look at a number of those things. And then you think, OK, well, this is a whatever size transaction, and this country represents 2% of the, of the yeah. value of the transaction. Let's just run the risk and close around it. Well, you have to be careful there, one, because you don't want to be, you prefer not to be violating local law. You want to see if you really can do that. But also, I think, that, I think there's some legitimate issues that I don't know if have been countered a lot, but I think there's a precedent in Delaware where the board of the buyer may not be willing to waive a closing condition to close around a transaction because it could be a per se violation of fiduciary duties to violate a law, even a foreign law. Yeah. So it will get very, very complex. The pressure to do something about it increases a lot on one side or both sides. That can affect decision making a little bit. So it's important to be cognizant of it up front and contemplate it early on. You don't want to be improvising. If you're going to try, try and come up with a whole separate strand, uh, strategy, try and anticipate it in advance have, and have thought through it a little bit more before you do it. But other than that, there are no good answers because you can be stuck. Antitrust regulators increasingly worldwide are talking to one another. Mm -hmm. That can be good because they like to, they too, like to not hold up transactions, but that can be bad because based on what a perception is in one country or another, they'll hold off and wait, and then when an approval comes through, they're actually not finished or something's changed locally. So it's it's complicated. You agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think yeah. I, we get that question a lot. Okay, you just have X jurisdiction. Can we go? Um, but I think you know there have been a couple jurisdictions that have really got out in front on finding carve outs. But I think we're going to start seeing that more from some of the usual suspects, the Brazils and the Chinas. We're seeing it from some smaller countries now, too, um, or countries going after, even if it's not a carve out, OK, you structured your deal in such a way to maybe avoid notification in China. We're not going to let you do that. Um, so, so I think it's, a, it's, it's something that you have to manage. Yeah, yeah. and I, I will tell you on the sell side, right, in a public company context, um, you know, obviously, Value matters. There are other aspects of any deal that matter, but really our, our, our goal is to deliver a closing, right? That is, from the sell side, fiduciary perspective, get this to a closing and everything else will fall into place. I think it's really, really important that when you get into something that has multiple regulatory approvals that are going to be implicated, you need to be thinking through how you're going to get this in front of the board 
in a way that is synthesized so that they understand it. But most importantly, you've created a record from a fiduciary perspective that the board of the sell side understood the risk that you wouldn't get one or more regulatory approvals, how you were gonna treat that in the contract and what the remedy is in those circumstances. And you don't need to overwork it. And, and I can tell you, we spend a lot of time making sure we don't overwork it for boards, but you've got to be able to create the record that when they signed up for the deal, they knew what the commitments were and they knew what the signing, you know, they knew what the signing, the closing risk was and that they could reach a judgment in the exercise of their fiduciary duties that allowed them to sign up for whatever the commitment was. You've got to get it to the board. You can't have a situation where, you know, you didn't get regulatory approval and there is no record that the board even considered the antitrust risk. And it's a simple thing to say but there's a lot of pressure to get through these things. And, and you will, I think we can all agree, you'll regret it in a dynamic where you've got to go back and recreate the record after the fact. Yeah, and to go to my point, you might be, you'll be much better off if you've created that record early in a deal where it's one among any deal points and it's thoughtful, as opposed to I, I have one country or two countries where I don't have an approval yeah. and I have to make a specific decision yeah. on that point. That's much harder for the board. It's probably much harder to paper allow the board to exercise a, regional ju a, a reasonable judgment in that context. Yeah. You, make a, you make an interesting point, Michael, and I, I know we're, we're out of time, but I'll leave. I, I do know that on the sell side, and Jessica and I have had this conversation a lot where she's educating me and getting me to the right place, but I will say, look, it's a public company deal. Really, the only risk, you know, the only real regulatory approval is the U.S., you know, HSR risk. Um, a very US centric approach. I think we can't have closing conditions in jurisdictions, whether, you know, I guess suspensory jurisdiction, but where the operations are de minimis, we can't agree to this. And Michael, your point's a good one. I, even if the contract doesn't contemplate an explicit condition um, that relates to a non US regulatory, I'm not sure what happens. I'm not sure what happens from the sell side. So you need to do the work to understand where the risk is. I don't know what happens in that set of circumstances. Probably not going to get specific performance. <laughs> right, right, and that's the that's the risk. So, if you don't mind, Scott, I'll, I'll kick it off. Just could we go back to divestiture caps, and could you give us your thoughts or guidance on how those are structured from an accounting perspective? So, um, are those EBITDA caps? Are they revenue caps? Does it vary? And if so, what would be recommended? And yeah, it's a great it's a it's a great question. I think it is very fact specific, so that's an unsatisfying answer. Um, I think you see, you, you, I, have, I have certainly seen it done where it was tied to EBITDA. Um, it can be tied to revenues, although in both cases, you need to be very thoughtful, right? Because the way you define those um, is going to be, you know, it's, it's, you know, in a sense, it's possible because you really got to, you have to understand the business, the industry, where the markets overlap, what it is you are, what you're trying to address. And, and in a sense, the deal maker part of it, tell me where the risk is, we'll then figure out the right way to address the solve. So we, and, and that'll drive how we define the divestiture commitment, not coming into it with a, uh, with a model that says, let's tie it to EBITDA revenue. Tell me where the overlap is, we'll make the words work because we know where we have to have a commitment. It can be, it can be tied to a specific business or line of business, right? As opposed yeah. to revenue or EBITDA. Yeah. Yeah. capacity, there, there are all sorts of ways, exactly as Scott said, what's the problem and we'll figure out the words. All, all goes right back to how, how critically important it is to have done the substantive work with the experts to really understand the risk and, and really dug in. And it doesn't happen all the time, right? Yeah, and it can be hard, especially in deals that are sort of, there are only a few people under the tent. It can be really hard to come to joinder on, we agree these are the problem areas, where we agree that the problem areas sort of can be described and capped in this way. Um, I think you're absolutely right. You have to get the work done to have that kind of approach, but because it is difficult to have that kind of approach, that's why you're seeing the more general MAE type caps, because it's, it's, it's easier to do the antitrust work when the deal is public. Yeah, well, that's a great point. So, so we have... Uh live public deal that's come in this week. People want to sign the day after the long weekend. There is no way we're going to do the analysis. We're going to have to do something, yeah. and it's tough. Um, so not a, not a satisfying answer, but there's, you know, very fact specific. Well, and I, a lot of the independent accounting experts will have, like Amanda in her practice at EY, will have to 
we'll have to argue that out after the fact mm -hmm. and renegotiate what was EBITDA and how was revenue calculated. And even though it seems like it should be straightforward, but that's where the disputes come in after the fact. So, And yeah. the words matter on the page, yeah. however you define it and whether it's defined as a business, as a more specific revenue or EBITDA calculus, the words, the words matter in the paper. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, good morning, uh, Mohit Singh from BP. Great, great discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, the one, one thing I was hoping to hear about, I didn't hear it, was, um, you know, when foreign companies are buying assets in the U.S. and the whole CFIUS approval process. Uh, that's a big concern for us. I'm in the energy business. I mean, we are trying to get foreign investors in, and we spend a lot of time talking about with our attorneys, okay, do we need to make that a BSCP or, or not? And um, would be curious uh, what you all have seen in your experience on that front. Yeah, so, so great, great question. You know, the reality is probably you need a whole separate session on CFIUS with the experts. I, 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 it is incredibly... It is an incredibly sensitive area. We're, you know, we are doing a deal right now with, in the telecom space. It is not one that if you'd asked me four or five years ago whether I thought this would, um, this would trigger review, I, I, it's not, it wasn't you know, intuitive to me. It is now a um, you know, threshold issue right now. The rules are going to change, but the threshold issue is do you have to file or otherwise. Um, I'm seeing it as conditions. More often than not, a lot of the work is around, you know, What's the risk, and and are we gonna are we gonna file? And and you know you both have been through this um, very tricky issue, and can have timing implications right. as well. Yes, <laughs> yeah. significant ones. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yes. And 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 you know you know what I'd say on that is, you know, common sense dictates mm -hmm. get the experts. Yeah, you really got to have the experts involved. Um, and I am, I am not that guy, but uh, you, you, do, you do need that. Yeah, and similar question, actually, and Echo, great presentation, very informative. Um, getting into politics, obviously, is tricky, and especially in this current environment, but for, from a regulatory landscape, do you see, kind of, depending on which political party is in power, how that impacts some of these issues? It, it it does. I, I'll, I'll start. I think we all probably have views on that. I, you know, I think that when the current administration came in, w there was a, 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 an assumption that it would be more pro-deal, more business friendly. I, I don't think that should shock anybody in here. I don't think we're finding that to be the case as the rule deals are still getting scrutiny at the DOJ and the FTC. Um, and the FTC is a little more balanced politically anyways. But deals are still getting scrutiny, um, and I, uh, I wouldn't necessarily have thought that they would get as much scrutiny as some, of, as some of them are. I think, you know, when I think about the current political climate and what it means for antitrust, there are a lot of conversations gearing up for the presidential election about is tech too big, this, that, and the other. I think that's very political and in some ways removed from classic antitrust, and so I don't know what will happen with that when these people actually sort of end up doing the job of the antitrust lawyer. Um, and then the thing I'd add in terms of sort of the pendulum swinging politically and what we're seeing at the DOJ right now that's been a little bit um, surprising is there's, as was mentioned earlier, there's been a shift away from behavioral remedies. And this, this has had a huge impact on people's ability to do vertical deals because you can't necessarily fix those structurally without sort of not doing the deal or divesting the huge chunk of business. So that's one thing that has become interesting in a political sense because it's driven from the current administration's view that they are not regulators, they are law enforcement. And regulators can, can follow along a behavioral remedy and make sure people are you know, doing what they're supposed to do, but law enforcement isn't supposed to do that. And so that's one way I think we're seeing current political climate play out in policy. And it has made it very hard for vertical deals, and what you're seeing as a result is people sort of, because they can't do a behavioral remedy, maybe they can satisfy it commercially outside the, the agency process. So those are just some initial thoughts. I would say a historical thing would be based on the administration and their approach. Yeah. You would have made an assessment and deals, obviously. You guys do deals. Uh, it, our time, that's, that can be a very relevant consideration. 
what's changed, one of the things that's changed is, is you would have made a general assessment of likelihood, but it would have been kind of like a seesaw, mm -hmm. been up or down. But now the combination, at least in the US, of, of this particular administration, the rise of populism, the concerns around technology, which are part populist but part real, like how do you do antitrust regulation in the technology world, mean that there's a lot more uncertainty, I think. Yeah. It's very hard. It's, it's gotten harder than it ever was to maybe predict in a particular case yeah. what's going to happen. I, 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 I actually just could not agree more. And, and it isn't a political statement at all, but I think what's harder now for us, and um, dating myself a little bit because you can start to juxtapose it with different administrations, is just the unpredictability. And, and, and it's crazy. It's literally. We are seeing deal dynamics shift based on whether the president has tweeted something. Yeah. And again, not a, not, a it, 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 not a statement at all in terms of whether good or bad or indifferent, just it is very <laughs> hard to give thoughtful, sensible, measured advice with any degree of certainty. Just as an anecdote, and I know we're running out of time in this public at AT&T, you know, we advise the board, no vertical merger has been rejected by the DOJ in 50 years, yeah. which was factually correct and yeah. totally consistent with antitrust doctrine. And look what happened. Yeah. Look what happened. The transaction got challenged. And then the ruling got appealed. We were very surprised. Everybody was. So, uh, so <laughs> yes, it was not just you. <laughs> Well, we've run uh, tight on time, but a fascinating discussion, which I think we should continue uh, over coffee during the break. So thanks again, everyone, for your questions. Thank you for the panel.